Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. We'll get started in just a moment. I don't see them yet. Um, with Zoom, it takes a while for everyone to transfer from the waiting room into the uh, the actual okay. webinar forum, okay. which is why we we give it a moment after we start the webinar. Okay. But uh, if you open up the participants panel, and on the right hand side you can see attendees. Everyone, the everyone in chat now. Okay. Okay, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr. I am the Chief Knowledge Broker for Octo, Open Communications for the Ocean. And we're so glad you can be with us today for today's webinar, Be a Better Coastal Adaptation Practitioner with Behavior Change. Uh, this is being presented by Dr. Carolee Shumway. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about Carolee. Dr. Carolee Shumway is the Director of the Center for Behavior and Climate which was founded to advance the use of behavior change tools to solve our climate crisis for practitioners and educators. A marine biologist and behavioral neuroscientist by training, Carolee has 25 and plus years of experience in marine, freshwater, and land conservation, behavior change, sustainable development, policy research, and outreach in the U.S., Africa, Asia, and the South Pacific. In 2016 to 2017, she focused on innovations for development as USAID's chief scientist for the Global Development Lab, senior science advisor to USAID's administrator and director of the Center for Development Research. She has also been executive director of three environmental NGOs and has held senior positions at the Nature Conservancy and the New England Aquarium. She is very open to collaboration with any group seeking to apply behavior change to their program. Uh, and we're very pleased to have Carol with us today uh, to be talking with us. Um, I wanted to let you guys know, um, before we get started, Carolee will be presenting. She's going to have a number of interactive parts, so she'll be asking um, questions, and she'd love some responses from you guys in the webinar chat. Um, and after the web the presentation ends, we will have dedicated time for question and answer. Um, you can send in questions for Carolee in two ways. You can put them in the Q&A section of the user interface. Um, that's easier to moderate, so I prefer if you put them there, your questions for Carolee. But you can also put questions in the webinar chat. And if, if it was a question you wanted input from everyone on the webinar on, feel free to put it in the chat. Um, and you guys are able to uh, post information for each other uh, in, the in the webinar chat. We encourage you to do so, but just please keep it on topic and professional. Um, so Carolee, we'll turn it over to you now. Thank you so much for being with us today. Great, thank you so much, Sarah and Octo for inviting me, I really appreciate it. Um, so at the Center for Behavior and Climate, we teach behavior change for climate action to climate professionals and educators, nonprofits, governments, and students. This year, for example, we worked with the CDC and eight state public health agencies on behavior messaging for climate health risks. We also offer free courses on climate solutions and climate science. If you want to really yeah, slow down just a tad. Okay. If you want to learn more about behavior change for climate action, we're offering a three-week virtual workshop starting October 1st. There are a few slots remaining if you're interested in signing up, and you can register on the workshop page on our website shown here. So why am I giving this talk? I gave this talk, I gave a, a talk on behavior change a couple of years ago to Octo, but last year I attended a New England climate adaptation conference and not one word was made about behavior change for climate adaptation. Having been a marine and freshwater conservationist myself for many years, I know that climate adaptation efforts are really diverse, including policy, I'm sure this is only a smattering of them, right? Including policy initiatives, participatory action planning, land use regulations, climate acidification efforts, disaster preparedness planning, restoration, outreach, freshwater management, base of species management, nature-based solutions and retreat. And that's not counting um, the more hidden aspects of adaptation efforts to the general public, including stormwater management and infrastructure. Almost all of these efforts can, be, can benefit from understanding what motivates people to act as individuals, as groups, and as society. So here's our agenda for today. We're gonna basically go over the behavior change process, then evidence-based 
behavioral barriers to climate adaptation, and then what behavioral tools work, social norms, identity, efficacy, legacy motivation, nudge, and then we will um, move to reaching different audiences with framing. Almost all of what I'm presenting today is evidence-based from adaptation studies. When a slide shows a, a blue shell like this, it's I'll be talking about a paper that's directly related to coastal and marine climate adaptation. So why use behavior change in climate adaptation? Because the evidence is clear, environmental education by itself is just not enough to motivate people to act. And because behavior change is a critical component of the systemic change that we need to, to address the climate crisis via both mitigation and adaptation. This figure shows behavior change as one of the gears, but I would also note that behavior change is critical for increasing the adoption of innovations, ensuring the efficacy of change agents, and ensuring the efficacy of policies and institutions. Our perspective is that collective and individual action leads to societal change, as shown by those outward arrows. You could think of collective and individual action as providing the scaffolding to support government and business change. Note though, that societal and societal or structural forces such as existing policies and infrastructure can, as shown by these orange arrows, can limit or block both individual and collective climate actions as reflected by the arrows going the other way. So as a simple example from climate mitigation, mitigation, if there's no public transportation available, such as in rural areas, you can't get individuals or groups to use less cars to reduce carbon emissions. So let's go over the behavior change process. First, what is behavior? Behavior is any observable thing that a person or animal does or the actions or reactions to an external or internal stimulus. So a climate action is a behavior and behavior change is any modification to a given behavior. There are five steps to the behavior change process. First, you identify the audience that you're trying to reach and the target behavior, what you're trying to change or have them do. Second, you identify the key barriers holding your audience back from that action. You need to understand it from their perspective. You don't make assumptions here. You can use focus groups, interviews, or surveys to get at these, the answer to those questions. Third, you identify appropriate behavior change tools using relevant behavioral models, and then you design and test. And this can often be an iterative process. There are at least seven known behavioral barriers to climate adaptation. Bechtold et al. in this uh, paper, this great paper, um, breaks, the, breaks the barriers up into individuals, groups, and organizations and societies. So the barriers at all of those at, at each of those levels. The correlation coefficient is shown on the right, with the red being a very strong correlation. Um, uh, for that particular variable and blue and the blue showing um, sort of medium effects, moderate effects um, of that particular variable. So when we get to individuals, uh, barriers include climate change beliefs. This is something like um, the Yale program on climate change communication, how they segment the audience so that those who are disengaged in de denial or dismissive are less likely to be willing to adapt. The next barrier is negative affect which includes the emotions like fear, guilt, or anger um, upon experiencing climate impact. Experience with climate impacts was significantly correlated with climate adaptation action, but this barrier is tricky to, uh, to work with because too much emphasis on fear, and I'll show you later, can lead to inaction. And then the third barrier here is lack of efficacy or feeling like you don't have the ability to do something. People with a low sense of self-efficacy do not perceive themselves as able to act on threats, as shown by Adger et al. When you get to the group level, oh, by the way, um, Tan Su et al. showed that efficacy was an important factor in low and middle income countries as well. And that paper down there by Null et al. also looks at efficacy in Indonesia, China, uh, I think the Netherlands, um, the US and maybe Sweden. So five countries in that paper. When you get to groups, two barriers are perceived responsibility, 
whether people perceive ad adaptation as their responsibility. So if people feel that governments, for example, are the ones solely that need to act, then that can reduce their willingness to engage. Conversely, if people feel that the, oops, that the burden is entirely on them, they may go into denial. The second barrier at the group level is social pressure um, countered by social norms, which I'm gonna cover next. And at the societal level, barriers include worldview. Societies with an individualistic worldview are less willing to pay for adaptation efforts compared to societies with more of a collective attitude. In addition, certain worldviews can also lead to psychological reactance, climate denial, and a corresponding resistance to change. And the last barrier we have here is values that are tied to, to uh, people's morals, moral foundation. So the tools to address for climate adaptation action are social norms and other types of social modeling like social identity, efficacy, legacy motivation, nudge, and frame, framing to address worldview and values. I note that social norms and efficacy have also been shown to be important in, in predicting the collective action we need to drive change. So those would be useful when you wanna get people involved in advocating for policy change, adaptation planning, or involved in restoration initiatives. <clears throat> we'll now go over those each, each of these tools one by one. Social norms and other types of social modeling are a great tool to use to address the barrier of social pressures holding people back from climate action. There are two types of social norms, descriptive norms, beliefs about what others are doing, and injunctive norms, beliefs about what others should be doing. So an example of a descriptive norm is the belief that others don't worry about climate change, which is not true, by the way. And an example of an injunctive norm, what people should be doing or not, should not be doing, is recycling is good or littering is bad. Evidence shows that people are more likely to engage in sustainable behavior if their in-group members do so too. We are a social species. Here's an example from climate adaptation. Ideas 42 increased the response rate of residents to flood insurance affordability surveys using positive social norms. Low et al. had previously shown that the likelihood of having flood insurance was associated with social norms. And interestingly, it was not associated with perceived flood risk. So Ideas 42 redesigned the envelope to residents to get more people to uh, take the survey using the positive social norm message, join hundreds of property owners in your area, lowering their flood insurance costs. They also applied a deadline to convey urgency um, and you must respond in a week and the response rate increased 15 fold. So how effective are social norms and other social comparisons? Very. Berquist et al. conducted a super meta-analysis analyzing 10 meta-analyses of interventions aimed at increasing pro-climate behavior. In this case, this is largely climate mitigation actions. The studies reviewed included a variety of interventions across multiple pro-environmental behaviors. And of, the, of these, um, among these studies, social comparison and financial incentives were the most effective interventions at increasing pro-climate behaviors. Note that education had the lowest impact. And, and on the adaptation side, Van Valkengode and Steg found that knowledge was weakly correlated with adaptation action. So recent research indicates that dynamic or trending social norms, a type of positive social norm can greatly increase the percentage of people who perform a given behavior. A dynamic norm provides information about how other people's behavior is changing over time. That's the key. Sparkman and Walton compared subjects' responses to dynamic versus static norms used to encourage reducing meat consumption. The static norm statement was 30% of Americans make an effort to limit their meat consumption. The dynamic norm statement was in the last five years, 30% of Americans have now started to make an effort to limit their meat consumption. This figure shows that a dynamic norm approach nearly doubled the response, the number of participants who ordered a meatless lunch after participating in the experiment. Here, the y-axis is the percentage ordering a meatless lunch, and the x-axis are the two conditions, static and dynamic versus a control. 
I just thought you might be interested that this dynamic norm approach is even being used in political efforts. This is a postcard uh, trying to get more Virginians to register to vote. And you can see it's showing that more and more Virginians are voting. Um, and then it, it, it pushes the social norm message by don't be left behind, vote also. Okay, now it would like to have you type your answer in the chat. Which one message below is best for encouraging people to take hurricane protection measures around their home that uses a dynamic social norm? So you're gonna put in the chat A, B, or C. So A, I just put up hurricane shutters on my home, says actress Jennifer Gardner. B, in the last two years, more and more people are using hurricane shutters. C, 45% of ex-residents have put up hurricane shutters on their home. Okay, most of you got it. The correct answer is B because it, it has in the last two years more and more people. So it's got an aspect of time. C tells you a percentage of people doing it, but it's not a dynamic norm. Good job, everybody. You can also consider messaging with social identity to encourage people being prepared. Um, we created the billboard on the left uh, when I was uh, executive director of the Merrimack River Watershed Council to use social identity, encouraging someone, um, basically praising someone for being a good parent and using that praise for them being a good parent to encourage them supporting land protection for wildlife babies too. I realized a little bit of a stretch, but we we're trying to figure out how we how we could could reach them. And then you could use, in your case, you could use something like the figure on your right in a message such as, you've always protected your family, protect them and your home from storm surge. Okay, try it for yourself. Which message below frames with social identity? Um, some famous athlete protects his family from storm surge with dune grass, you should too. North Carolinians always prepare for hurricane winds, prepare for storm surge with dune grass, or see more and more people are protecting their homes from storm surge with dune grass. The correct answer is indeed uh, B. Um, and the reason is um, North Carolinians would, would have an identity as being a North Carolinian. There's a great paper of um, using social identity in New Zealand. And in that case, um, uh, association, the, the, they were able to tap into a green identity. Many New Zealanders uh, said that being, having a, being green was an identity of a New Zealander. Okay, now we're gonna to turn to the second tool for motivating climate adaptation actions, efficacy. So let's face it, we all need to feel in control and effective to motivate action. Washington Post columnist, Amanda Ripley writes, humans need a sense of agency. Feeling like you and your fellow humans can do something, even something small, is how we convert anger into action, frustration into invention. I'm sure so many of you have attended talks where the ratio of bad news to good is nine to one, just one climate disaster image after another. This problem, the problem is that people feel climate despair with too many climate, negative climate stories and images. This graph from Felbin and Hart shows um, a self-reported fear scale. The x-axis breaks out respondents by political ideology, and then they compared presenting the respondents um, just climate impacts, impacts plus actions or actions alone. If you just presented climate impacts, um, fear was absolutely the highest. If you just presented climate actions, that reduced fear the most. And if you presented impacts plus actions, that's the middle, the middle bars and the, um, the lighter gray bars. Another immobilizing emotion beside climate despair that affects efficacy is climate anxiety, the emotional distress to individuals caused by climate change. Climate anxiety manifests in many forms from feelings of helplessness and despair to anger and guilt. It surged among climate concerned populations as shown in this modified figure from Heiser and Lynch. Younger generations appear to struggle the most. 
72% of college students reported negative emotions about climate change issues, including fear, anger, sadness, and shame. And only 28% reported feelings of hope. Adger et al. found that both perceived self-efficacy, whether one perceives one can make a difference, and outcome efficacy, whether the proposed action makes a difference, both of those mattered. So how do you increase efficacy? Well, first, you increase a person's belief that they can make a difference. You can promote direct, personal, firsthand experiences in some kind of action, or you share a success story showing that a particular adaptation action was successful. Second, you highlight the importance of individual actions contributing to the collective goal. Collective efficacy has been shown to be among the most important motivators. Waters et al. 2024 found that collective efficacy messages to Australians influenced uptake of a broad range of, of pro-environmental, pro-climate behaviors and intentions. And Hornsey 2022 notes, Individuals only seem to be able to be convinced they can make a difference with climate change when they are told that collectives can make a difference. Third, um, you can encourage the, the, that working together will reduce or address climate risks. Working together is another social norm appeal. Together we can make a difference. And finally, you can help people identify with a particular group that's already taking action on climate change using social norms. Messages about what others are doing. Join the majority and add your support to this climate bill. Note that taking action also helps address climate anxiety uh, because it channels those emotions into empowering action. Okay, now to cognitive biases. You would think that those living on the coast or relying on marine resources would act in the face of climate change if they had the resources and capacity and time to do so. However, much to the chagrin of economists, we humans often do not act in a rational actor manner due to cognitive biases. I've categorized five of the most important ones for climate, I'd say for climate adaptation here. First, we discount the future and favor the present. Present bias, this is called present bias and future discounting. This is one of the toughest factors we have, we face for climate adaptation. Healy et al. 2009 showed that voters reward politicians for disaster relief spending, but not for disaster preparedness spending, even though preparedness spending clearly saves money for all in the long run. Second, we rationalize behaviors that are inconsistent with our worldview, identity, or behavior. This may cause procrastination and, and cognitive dissonance. Third, we simplify decision-making with cognitive shortcuts that may prove faulty, such as single action bias or the availability heuristic. Single action bias uh, is people's tendency to respond to the need to take action by making just one change, one action, such as hoarding toilet paper during COVID-19. I did that, I'm sure probably many of you did the same thing, making that one change reduces guilt and worry and can make further action less likely. The availability heuristic means people's tendency to respond more actively to adaptive action immediately following a natural disaster. So people who have already experienced a catastrophic event overestimate the probability of occurrence of that event compared to those who just read about it on the news. And on the positive side though, you can tap into the availability heuristic by encouraging people to proactively protect family and property after a natural disaster so that they are prepared the next time. A great tool to use to address present bias and or future discounting is legacy motivation. Legacy motivation overcomes present bias by linking the present to the future, increasing an individual's affinity with and identification with future generations, such as one's own children or future children. This is a great video by Prince EA and the Nature Conservancy you can get on YouTube, and I encourage you to see it. This is just a screenshot from that, that video. Legacy motivation enhances climate change beliefs, pro-environmental intent, and donations. Evidence shows that legacy motivation is the predominant reason for climate action. The Potential Energy Coalition just tested people around the world on their main reason for climate action. Legacy motivation to protect the planet for future generations 
was 12 times more powerful message than messages to increase jobs or to reduce social inequality. Um, and Yale's program on climate change communication just confirmed this in the US showing that the top reason across all political ideologies for climate action was to provide a better life for our children and grandchildren. Legacy motivation can also be an effective technique for convincing politicians. Sherman et al. 2020 showed that legacy motivation was the most effective messaging approach for citizen advocates in talking with their legislators or their staff. This could be expressed as the legacy of the politician in passing a given bill or the legacy to the person's children and other children in doing so. And legacy motivation significantly predicts Latinos' support for climate policies. Recently, Pearson et al. 2021 reported that the predominant value for Latinos with respect to climate beliefs was legacy motivation. Pearson et al. called this family values writ large, but with this actually included legacy motivation or the concern that climate change would harm their children or grandchildren. So try it for yourself. Which one message ending below uses legacy motivation? Will you send this letter supporting the Climate Resilience Act to your politician, A, to help protect our community, B, to reduce the cost of disasters to families, or C, for the sake of your children and children's children? Okay, you guys all got that. Good job, everybody. That was great. So uh, it's really a powerful, motivating technique. Sutton um, 2020 used legacy motivation and other framing methods as she engaged in discussion with focus groups in Nova Scotia dealing with coastal climate risks. Her research asked the question, was any framing narrative more effective than other framing in motivating people to discuss the need for changed approaches to their coast? So she, uh, she'd start the discussion with one of three approaches. She compared past framing and so, for example, um, she would say, how has your coast changed for reasons other than climate change, such as infrastructure economy, and how did that affect your community? And she compared that with future framing, which is legacy. What do you love about this coast that you hope future generations will get to experience? And what is your duty to those future residents? And the last narrative framing was focused on um, space. She calls it space, place, or meaning framing. Um, but basically, she focused on wartime mobilization for World War II. And how did the residents of your community face wartime mobilization? And what do you think made it possible for them to do so? She found that the legacy framing was the most effective. Following this framing, it caused the majority to use more urgent language around the need for change and increased participants' support of coastal adaptation measures. Another tool to address a cognitive bias, to address cognitive dissonance and procrastination is a nudge. A nudge is a deliberate effort to change behavior by steering people in a particular direction while preserving freedom of choice. This may work to encourage people to do things in and around their own home that they may put off doing. Nudges simplify choosing by changing the way choices are presented through choice architecture. For example, making a preferred choice the default option, so people pick it out of inertia, um, like this in this case, oop, in this case, an insurance company uses a default option to automatically include flood insurance with home insurance, or putting the preferred option first while still offering the second, or limiting the less desirable choices, or incentives. In this case, a nonprofit encourages purchase of hurricane shutters with a website link and coupon. Limitations of a nudge are it's not long lasting. Use of social norms actually lasts longer. It can offend some people, uh, in particular offending groups in which perceived behavioral control is very important. And it may reduce support for more significant changes being made, which lessens the appeal of more aggressive climate actions as shown by Hagman et al. So it's helpful to point out that nudges are useful, but not sufficient to bring about change. Here's an example of choice architecture. Consider these two presentations to encourage people to buy food with less of a carbon impact. This first option just describes the various choices. You see, it just lists them. Beef mints, ranging from beef mints to plant-based mints to chicken mints. And this 
option presents color coding and numbers to make it easier and faster to choose the product that is less harmful. You can see just by looking at this that clearly the green plant-based mints would be the option that you would choose based both on the color, uh, the coloring of the um, number as well as the, C the CO2 equivalent rating. Okay, try it for yourself. Which two answers use choice architecture to encourage the purchase of homes on stilts by homeowners? A, send a notice to all residents. Urge, so now you want two answers. <clears throat> send a notice to all residents, urging them to consider purchasing homes on stilts. B, work with developers to offer fewer homes without stilts. Or C, ask realtors if they can post homes with stilts before those without stilts in realtor magazines. Okay, this one seems to be a little harder harder for people. So um, sending an so the the correct answer is indeed B and C. And so B B you're sort of limiting you're limiting the choices. So you're still you're you're still allowing people to have um, homes without stilts, but there's less fewer options. And C um, by having the homes with stilts before, you might get people to uh, be more interested in viewing those. Um, in the Realtor Magazine and on, online. So in sum, for this part of the talk, uh, the behavior change process is to identify the audience, target behavior, barriers, tools, and then you get, you've got a test. And tools to increase motivation for climate adaptation are social norms, social identity, increase efficacy, legacy motivation, and nudge. Okay, so, so far we've, cons we've covered four out of five tools I wanna share with you today. The last tool is framing. Framing helps you reach different audiences and motivate different audiences, especially those hard to reach. The first slide, this first slice of the pie is for the group we've primarily been talking about, people who already acknowledge climate change exists and who worry about it, the converted as, as identified by Yale's program on climate communication. Now, now we're gonna consider the disengaged, doubtful, and dismissive segment. For this segment, you can reach them through framing using social norms, cultural values, and morals, messengers, and if needed, pre-bunking misinformation. Hein et al. compared climate adaptation messages that worked with Australian conservatives uh, versus the uncommitted segment and the alarmed segment. Who, who worry about climate change and found that as shown by the yellow, as first I'm gonna show you the red dot, that referring to climate change was detrimental for the dismissive segment. In contrast, what did work for this conservative audience was specific adaptation advice, negative uh, emotive content and highlighting local impacts. The good news was that this framing was also beneficial for the other audience segments as well. Now here in the US, why do we even consider, or even or Australia, I'll show you that in a second, why do we even need to consider different messages for this audience? Because we are the most polarized country, large country in the world with respect to climate change. We are four times more polarizing than, more polarized than the average of other countries. Australia runs a close second. So on this figure, the y-axis um, shows the percentage of people in each country who agree that the government needs to immediately act to address climate change. And the uh, x-axis shows uh, whether people consider themselves extreme left or extreme right. So you can see how far, uh, how separated the US is when you compare the two extremes on this graph among the countries. Shown another way, this figure shows the gap in political support for climate action by country. So how do you reach this group? Remember the behavior change process. First, we consider the barriers. Numerous studies have shown lack of climate knowledge is actually not a barrier for this group. It's, that's not the problem. Specific climate knowledge, Personal assessment of climate knowledge and numeracy are generally at reasonable levels for this group. Four barriers hold conservatives back from climate action. 
including climate adaptation, worldview, morals, social pressure, and psychological reactance. We've already covered social pressure with social norms and social identity. And you can message selectively to reach those audiences with messages that counter those barriers. So the first barrier for this group is worldview, the set of cultural beliefs that people use to see and interpret the world. In cultural theory, there are four main worldviews, hierarchical, individualistic, fatalist, fatalistic, and egalitarian. Evidence from both political campaigns and health campaigns have shown that messaging based on people's worldview is persuasive, increasing intention and changing attitudes. Hierarchists and individualists are most relevant for conservatives. According to Shui et al. 2014, hierarchists seek to maintain existing power structures that protect their interests. Individualists value their independence above all else, or you could say freedom. They value their freedom above all else. Fatalists think that what happens in society is beyond their control. And egalitarians care about social injustice, social freedoms, and support participatory democracy. Now, hierarchical or individualistic cultural worldviews are negatively correlated with climate change risk perception. And Bechtold et al. cites Allo and Loreo, who showed that individualistic societies, I mentioned this earlier, also have a lower willingness to pay for adaptation compared to collectivist societies. So why is this? Well, individualists support free market solutions and providing opportunities for people to maximize personal gain. Cultural theory posits that hierarchists and individualists perceive things as threatening if they threaten their preferred structure of social organization. So that may be why this group includes those who dismiss or deny climate change because accepting climate change could potentially lead to governmental regulation threatening personal, what they perceive as personal freedom and the pursuit of personal financial gain. The Center for Research on Environmental Decisions has produced a useful communications guide. While it's old, it's still useful for climate change, showing how you can frame selectively for different ideologies. This table shows the words that appeal to those with what they call a promotion or a prevention focus, the left words being more appropriate for liberals and the right side conservative. These words give you an idea of what you could do to tailor to worldview. So good words to use for liberals are all of these words here, including aspirational words like advance, aspire, support, nurture. Good words to use for conservatives are all of these words here, including words like responsibility, protect, duty, and obligation. So let's try it ourselves. Think about what kind of words you could use to tap into the conservative value of freedom of choice. Which, which message below reflects freedom of choice? Climate change is heating up our city. A, there are lots of ways to prevent heat stress. Con heat stress. Consider B, our city needs to reduce heat stress by regulating or C, protect your family from heat stress. Okay, um, there's there's a mixed opinion here. Some think it, some people think it's A, some people think it's C. Um, it, it would be A, because A is providing lots of choices, lots of choices, whereas C it has a different message, protect your family. So it does, it does, it, it does reflect a conservative value, but not this aspect of freedom of choice. The second barrier is moral foundations. The moral foundation of conservatives and liberals differ with some overlap. There are five overarching morals. In-group loyalty or loyalty to the group, purity, sanctity, physical or moral cleanliness, essentially the absence of disgust, either physical or religious. Note that the brains of conservatives and liberals differ in response to disgusting stimuli as shown by On, on et al. 2014. Researchers could predict with 95% accuracy whether someone was liberal or conservative just by looking at the fMRI scan of their brain. Authority respect, respect for one's leaders, fairness reciprocity, concern for whether actions are fair, and harm care, concern for whether actions harm others. 
Now, conservatives hold the top three morals, also called the binding morals, more strongly, and they share the other two, the individualizing morals, morals that protect individuals with liberals. Interestingly, the individualizing morals, fairness, reciprocity, and harm care predominate in the media, which may put off conservatives in articles and messages about climate change. So if that's your audience, don't lead with that. Okay, try it for yourself. Which two messages use in-group loyalty, a moral foundation favored by conservatives? A, we should all encourage heightening dikes to protect from flooding. B, a real American protects their neighborhood. Will you support heightening our dike? C, a patriot would protect this town and nation any way they could. That's why I'm asking you to support dike heightening to protect from us from flooding. Great job, great job, everybody. It was, it was, it's indeed B and C. Um, okay, just a couple more slides. Tools to counter the four barriers include social norms, which we already talked about, and credible messengers. Um, credible, who are credible messengers? They're the people that your audience trusts. Messengers can be either authority figures for, in this case, since we're focusing on conservatives, and let's say in the US, a government official like a Republican senator, or a change agent, for instance, a trusted community member who's similar to your audience. Depending on the circumstance, both types of messengers can be effective. The context and your audience should determine who the best messenger is for a particular situation. Well, this is not coastal. Here's a great example of a credible messenger change agent in rural lands from Climate Stories, North Carolina. My two favorite sports are trout fishing and migratory birds, uh, duck hunting. Those are two species that are particularly susceptible to climate change. Of course, trout require cold water to live. If water temperatures rise very much, they can't survive. Uh, I'm seeing trout streams warm up. Trout streams that used to fish very well don't fish as well anymore. When I visit one of our freestone trout streams, that I fished as a boy. And um, I know it to be a productive trout stream. And I get in it during the early spring and the water's warmer than it used to be. And I don't find fish there. I feel such a degree of loss. The sportsman uh, community is a fairly conservative community. We don't, like, we don't change much. And when I first hear, started hearing about uh, climate change, I thought, you know, that's, uh, that's something Al Gore cooked up in his basement for political purposes. But then I got older. And when I started comparing experiences that I've had in the past with, experience, with experiences I was having in the present, I realized that I was actually seeing change. Climate change in a warming world is impacting wildlife habitats and the sport that we love. We care about these animals and these fish far beyond the harvest. Um, and, but they don't have a voice. They can't speak to policy at a local, state, federal level, even global. It's our job to represent them um, in the decision-making bodies of this country. So we need to be verbal, we need to come with good science, and with personal observation, and with a passion. I want my granddaughters to in, be able to enjoy the same wild North Carolina that I have. I hope you like that. I think that's just a terrific video. It can sort of captures everything you want to, want to get in there, including legacy motivation at the end. So you can message selectively for frontline communities too. Ideally, you'd have a community partnership to help build trust and credibility on climate adaptation, one that helps emphasize co-benefits as well. And one way to reach, there's less, uh, there's fewer papers in, for these this audience, but uh, the way to reach these com communities is to use social norms, credible messengers, storytelling, and legacy motivation. 
Note that some of this uh, data comes from health communication studies, not climate adaptation, but because there's just so few papers out there on this topic. Social norms were shown to be an important influencing factor for African-American parents, at least for vaccines, using credible messengers that they trust. Um, his health studies of COVID-19 messaging had shown a profound lack of trust by African-American and Latino populations of governmental messages. Their doctor was considered credible. Doctor recommendations were associated with increased acceptance of the vaccine. You can also use culturally relevant outlets, conveying messages through church bulletins, Spanish language radio was found to be helpful to Latinos when conveying messages about influenza vaccines. Storytelling and legacy motivation, which I'd mentioned was the top motivator for Latino families with respect to climate change. So in sum, the way to reach the disengaged and doubtful is to use social norms, cultural values, and group morals, credible messengers. You may also need to pre-bunk misinformation should that occur. And the way to reach diverse audiences is social norms, credible messengers, storytelling, and legacy motivation. Thank you. I hope this webinar has convinced you of the importance of behavior change in the work that you do. Please note that what I present today will be offered by us as an online course that will be completed this year. So if you're interested in being notified about the course, please email us at the, that email uh, right there. And um, thank you so much for attending. Carly, this was wonderful. I mean, so useful. And I'm just thinking about it for, for all my various activities, not <laughs> in addition to my work. Um, so we have a few questions. I would strongly advise anyone who wanted their question asked to post it into the, Q, the question and answer panel because it's a little hard to uh, moderate from the chat right now. But keep using the chat by all means. But it's a little hard to uh, pick out what the questions are. Um, and I would also add, Carolee, there's been a number of requests for the um, yeah, yeah, the slides, yeah. if you're yeah. able to share them. Okay. Right. And, um, and so the email. So, um, I'll, I'll okay. And I'll let everybody know um, if we're able to share them, which it sounds like we are, they will be posted alongside the recording. So if you go to www.octogroup.org slash webinars, um, you'll have need to scroll down past our upcoming webinars to the recordings of previous webinars. But if you click the click to get into this webinar, um, at the bottom, there'll be um, the links to the recordings and you'll find a link to the slides too. I'll post theirs, those there as well. Okay, so starting with some of the questions that have been sent in, um, for one that came in during the webinar, has the impact of legacy motivation been evaluated by generation, Gen Z, millennials, et cetera, individuals without kids or strong family ties? That's a really good question. Um, I I guess what I would do is, um, so whether it's been evaluated for the childless cat ladies. <laughs> That's exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, I guess I I would look at the potential energy report. Um, so potential energy did a report 2023 on this topic um, and they provide all of the data in the back of that report. So don't be daunted by the size of that report because it's really just a lot of data. And, and I think, and so I don't know, I didn't look at that data closely enough to know if they broke it out by age, but that's a really good question. Thank you. Uh, and uh, it wasn't my question, but thank you to who sent it in. Um, another question, to what extent have you seen legacy motivation work to move multilateral discussions, um, that is national legacy, perhaps via the political legacy of particular state representatives, ministers, presidents, et cetera? That's a good question. I um, also, I there's there is evidence. I mean, we're just a social species. So we model our behavior based on what we see other people do. So it's not legacy motivation per se, but there's there is data showing, for example, that if you're and you can do this at any um, at any political scale, so that if you've got a, a particular town, I live in Rhode Island right now, there's 39 towns and we were working on stormwater uh, are actually on uh, water resource um, management efforts. And um, and it, 
one of the tricks is you can convince one town by saying the next town's doing it, if they are doing it. I mean, you always got to tell the truth. But um, so if you have adjoining states, you can work together and get one state to pass something and then use the, the next adjoining state to say, well, they passed it. So then you get more uh, incentive for the politicians to to pass that particular bill. And I think that's and that's true, you know, no matter how you nest, if you think of political scales, you nest it. That would be true at a national national level, too. So, you know, in this country, carbon pricing has been held back. Uh, quite a bit, but uh, Canada has now engaged in some aspect of car carbon pricing. And um, as I understand it, um, that uh, uh, Maine residents are a little bit upset because they can see their Canadian neighbors getting a monthly check um, from the um, uh, from the carbon pricing that they're not getting. And so you can so that that's one example of at least um, multinational um, influence that you can have. But I wouldn't call it legacy motivation per se. All right, thank you, Carolee. Um, there's a question, um, uh, well, actually, there were several questions that came in about the literature that you cited. Um, I think both orally and in the slide deck, is there a list available anywhere? Is most of it um, cited in the presentation itself? So if someone were to get the slides, they would be able to find it? Um, I have most of them on the slides um, and we have references right now because I presented at the Climate Adaptation Conference um, uh, the Sixth National Climate Adaptation Conference um, on climate health risks. We have a pretty uh, good reference list on our website right now from that. Um, but um, uh, we will be putting, when we finish this this online course, it will include um, a reference list of all of, the, all of those references that I cited today. All right, great. And where what URL should people go to for the course description? Um, for the, I don't have a URL. I don't have the right. online course on climate adaptation up yet on our website. The workshop that we're doing, which is this three-hour one, we're starting October first. That that that's on our workshop page, and we still have a few slots available. So if people want to register for that, um, that would be a three three week, one hour a week course on on just learning a little bit more about uh, behavior change for climate action. Okay, and while Carolee is busy answering question, if anybody had that pulled up, if you wouldn't mind posting it in the oh the, the URL I can put into it. the chat. I'm yeah, I'm happy okay. to do that. I'm happy to do that. Okay. All right, and that's up there. Okay, thank you, Carolee. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um. A question, are there any reports that look at these different motivations by gender? Yeah, there yeah, there are. Um, and um, so all of Yale's Yale's work, actually you can look at their national their opinion maps and you can break that out by gender and you can break that out by age and you can break that out by ideology, which is which is great. Um, there are uh, this um, this paper that I cited um, that I showed the barriers for, um, Bechtolt at all. Um, I, I don't have the paper yet, so I can only just share it, but the, the share what he, he or she says about it. But um, uh, there is a paper out there comparing um, more um, female-oriented societies versus male-oriented societies, and the female-oriented societies having more, um, are more receptive. Let me see, I didn't take notes on that. Um, societies um, uh, with male traits are less willing to adapt than those associated with female traits. Um, so, but I don't have that paper yet. I think that might be in the Allo and Lorero uh, reference that I have in, the, that I presented, talked about. Okay, all right. Thank you, Carolee. Um, question regarding the words that appeal slide. Um, this person asked, I tend to assume that, for instance, with climate, prevention words would still work with liberals as it bypasses their empathy appeal, but it still appeals to personal gain, which to some degree everyone has. Um, are you saying that just doesn't hold water? In other words, do you have to have two campaigns for messaging? Uh, for If you were messaging for liberals and conservatives, then I would use two campaigns, absolutely. Um, if you, then you can, you can tailor your messaging uh, more selectively and you'll have a better, better success. You know, just as I showed you the Hein et al. paper from Australia, 
uh, they uh, you know found that even just mentioning climate change was detrimental to encouraging climate adaptation efforts. So in that case, you know, you would definitely want to have two separate two separate campaigns. So that goes to the point I made at the very beginning of the of the webinar. You really need to know your audience. I, obviously, some people do outreach efforts, which you don't know what your audience is. And so then you then then I would probably lean towards um, more generic. Uh, but still highly useful, like legacy motivation, which seems to work across the board, as I sh as I mentioned. Um, but if you know your audience, you know you're in a rural area, or you know you're in a very conservative area, I would give a lot of thought as to how you frame your messages, because that can make all the difference. Just to uh, this, again, this is not climate adaptation, but Potential Energy also did a report on um, on ideological groups and how they respond to electric cars. Uh, in in the U.S. and I had thought I have I have an EV and I thought I could talk about electric cars by talking about the torque and acceleration and that would work for everybody you know but it turns out that um, uh, that's that's a terrible approach because um, uh, conservatives don't think electric cars are superior cars so you so right right off the start you're um, you, they're not listening to what you're saying because you're saying it's a great car and they're not and they're it it doesn't jive with what they're hearing about electric cars. So what actually the message that worked better for um conservatives was that we we all deserve the right. So see this is playing up into we all deserve the right to um to have affordable clean cars. So this preserves the freedom of choice that we have the right to pursue affordable clean cars. Um, but it, it addresses the affordability aspect and it addresses freedom of choice. Oh, I can't hear you, Sarah, you're muted. Oh, yes. I, well, fasc that's fascinating. Okay, thank you. Um, another question that came in, any suggestions for effective messaging for conveying the importance of equity in adaptation efforts? For example, messaging around climate gentrification. So I have been trying like crazy to find papers, and this is a big group. So if anybody has papers, put it in the chat uh, to find. So obviously environmental justice is, is critically important, but usually the way it's framed is just to highlight environmental, and uh, there's been so much environmental inequity. Um, but I'm trying to figure out, you know, are, what are the papers where you can talk to disadvantaged communities and motivate disadvantaged communities? And those papers just aren't out there. I can't find those papers. Um, so, um, I, in fact, I attended a, a webinar a couple weeks ago um, from a, um, uh, a fairly new um, Black environmental nonprofit. And um, they didn't have any, they didn't really provide any more information than um, about that. So I really, I, I think it's definitely a gap in our, in our understanding. Okay, thank you, Carolee. And if anybody knows of anything that might be useful, please post in the chat or, or send it to Carolee. Um, let's see. This was um, sort of relating to one of the first questions we asked. Does legacy motivation have the same strong impact among younger generations? Please clarify if legacy messaging is primarily aimed at conservative boomers. Oh, no, 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 no. It's not, it's not, it's not. So I, I, I realized I probably should have clarified that last time. Legacy motivation works across the board. It doesn't matter if you have kids yet or not. It's, it's really trying to... Um, so I used to work at the New England Aquarium, and uh, we and there was a survey by Belden and Rusinello a long time ago, looking at what motivated people to care about the environment, and what motive and legacy motivation was essentially the top motivator for people to care about the environment. It's just that people uh, have a have very strong desire to um, make the world a better place for 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 the future, um, and so you, whether you have kids or not. Uh, that that desire is 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 permeates uh, human society. Okay, thank you, Carolee. Um, we got we'll hit two more questions really quickly. Um, one, what's your sense of how the evidence is different from studies that have looked at behavioral intention versus actual behavioral or messaging experiments? My sense is experimental studies show weaker evidence for a lot of these things, including some experiments that have failed to detect effects from dynamic social norms on actual behavior. It's a really good question. The um, 
So there, there are only a few studies that actually document effect on actual behavior. Um, and we know if you, if you look at the um, theories of change, uh, we know that intention predicts only a third of the subsequent behavior that you're trying to get. So we know that intention predicts 30%, but we don't know what comprises the other 70%. Um, so uh, when I brought up, I brought up that social um, norms and efficacy have been demonstrated to directly influence behavior. So that paper is by Doherty and Webler, uh, 2016, and that's referring to, that's looking just at the alarm segment. So they already are very concerned about climate change and that's focusing on collective action. And, and so it shows that both that social norms and efficacy directly lead to uh, an increased collective action. Okay, thank you, Carolee. And I guess it didn't come as a surprise when I told you attendance of webinars was about a third of registration. <laughs> um, okay. There you go, and, attention. Uh, right, exactly. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, okay, last question. Um, do conservatives no longer trust data and science? Does it actually serve as a disincentive to cite research? Um, well, so I, that's a two-part question. So um, your first uh, assertion is correct. So I had to whittle my slides down and I was gonna show there is uh, the Pew, Pew research has shown, uh, looked across um, what, what groups, uh, different ideologies find credible in the US. And uh, scientists are ranked highly credible by, uh, by um, Democrats and, um, but not credible by conservatives. So that is a problem. Um, and similarly, actually both, both uh, sides, um, the least trusted uh, um, entity is um, the federal government, I hate to say. Um, and then in between there, you have uh, liberals support um, public teachers. They have fairly high credibility, but not conservatives. Um, nurses, um, actually have the highest credibility. So, um, and, and, and nurses are now entering into this, um, there's this whole area called planetary health. I'm, so, which I discovered this year myself, I'm not a, not a nurse, but, um, but nurses have entered into this, um, area of recognizing the connection between, um, physical and mental health and, and including climate, climate risks and, um, and climate change. Um, and so nurses actually tend to, are the the most credible segment that Pew looked at in this in this long list of of who was credible. And then okay. to your second question, um, which is is it a disincentive to cite? I I guess I would say as a scientist myself, um, it's always important to cite because. Um, uh, this is, you know, the data that you prove. I had to, I was contending with a climate uh, denier um, uh, scientist actually a couple months ago. And that was very tricky to write, to, to provide the data that showed um, uh, evidence that maybe might convince him, but I don't think I did. <laughs> so, but at least, but I think you have to hold, uh, you have to ha adhere to your standards of, of, of excellence and, and provide the data. Okay. All right. Carolee, this was wonderful. Thank you so much. We um, we hope you'll be on again in, in, in the future too. Uh, we, can, we need reminders of all these uh, really critical um, messaging. Uh, so <laughs> yes, tips <laughs> and tricks um, next time and, and every few years. Um, so thank you. This was super helpful, I think, for us in our in all of our work and other endeavors. Um, we really appreciate you coming on to share it with us. Great. I'm really happy to. Thanks. Thanks to meeting you all. Thank you. Okay. Bye. -bye. And thank you to everyone who attended. We we hope to see you in future webinars. Bye, guys. Bye.